In this episode of our best of season, we are satisfying our sweet tooth. I'm Kat Neville, and this is Feast TV. So in the best of season, I am going back and taking a look at the archives and really pulling out some of my favorite episodes. So in this particular episode of our best of season, you're going to travel back with me to some of my favorite sweet spots that we've had a chance to visit over the past few years. And during the episode, I am going to be making a chocolate tart because we're going to be visiting two places that are really well known for chocolate. And it's going to include candied ginger and ginger liqueur. It's gonna be delicious. And it's going to have a pretzel crust base, which is extremely simple to make, and it's going to have that wonderful salty element that's going to play right up against that dark chocolate. So the very first thing that I need to do to get my crust started is just smash up a bunch of these pretzels. It's just regular old pretzel rods. You can use the twisties, you can do gluten-free pretzels, whatever it is that works for you. So what I'm going to do is just take a big Ziploc bag fill it up with pretzels and smash them with my rolling pin. You could also put them in a food processor, but what fun would that be? Now I'm guessing here because I'm looking for a cup and a quarter of smashed up pretzels, and I honestly am not sure how, how many pretzels it will take to get to that volume of crumbs. So I'm gonna start here and we'll see what happens. I'm just about there with these pretzels. So while I finish this up, let's head over to Kansas City and meet the family behind an incredibly successful Mexican ice cream shop. Check it out. So I'm here at Pelotarius Tropicana in Kansas City, Missouri. We're here on a Monday and it still is pretty crowded, but on the weekends, there are 40 minutes, one hour waits to get your hands on one of those sundaes, funnel cakes, popsicles. You were telling me a little bit about your family and the history and how this is a part of your culture. So give me some insight into how this kind of food really plays a role in Mexican cuisine. In Mexico, this kind of uh, concept is very popular, but in different ways, like for example, like ice cream, ice cream bars and, and paletas, they sell it in the street. So me and my wife, we're talking about like, a, hey, there is a great, great opportunity to teach our culture for the Americans, you know, how we can sell our own popsicles and ice cream. So how long ago did the company start? We started in 2004, so we have almost like 13 years in this kind of concept. You and your wife founded the company, mm -hmm. but now your daughter Jennifer Correct. is the president of the company. Correct. Tell me what it's like to work with your daughter and how the two of you collaborate. So there is a good opportunity for her to business. take up the business. Yeah. So that's what are we including her in all kind of activities that we have. And so now I'm standing here with Jennifer at their brand new production facility. So before we go in, give me a primer on what specifically Mexican ice cream is, what makes them special. Our ice cream and our popsicles are 100% homemade. Our popsicles, they are a traditional Mexican treat. For someone who's never had one of these Mexican popsicles before, the flavors are not like your typical yeah. artificial oh, yeah. grape flavor yeah, or cherry. They're, they're pretty different. We have our mango with chile and tamarindo, so you know, we have our little spices that we put in there that makes it unique. And what has it been like for you to see this company grow? I mean, because you guys are yeah. exploding. It's really overwhelming. I can imagine that it would yeah. be. 
It's this tradition that your parents have brought with them and it's something that they remember from their childhood and they've made it part of your childhood and then also for all the kids who get to come in and I know that eventually you guys are going to have tours so that oh, yeah that's that's our main future goal here is you know kind of to give the kids an idea of how Mexican popsicles are made can we go see how they're made yeah let's right. go this is the fun part yeah so this is the first stop yes this is the first stop so I love the fact that you're starting with whole fruit. You're not getting in boxes of pre-cut up fruit. Why do you focus on everything being whole? Everything is 100%, you know, here. And it's the authentic flavor. Yeah, like this is how it's made in Mexico. This is how they make it in Mexico and, you know, just a tradition. You're not cutting any corners? Nope, not at all. Once we cut up our fruit, we go ahead and we just add water and sugar. Once it's all made, we just hurry up and pour it in there. Wow, so it's really fresh. Yeah, so everything is fresh. So now he's going to be loading it into this, what looks like a, a deep freezer kind yeah, of. Yeah, it has um, glycol in there, so that's what makes the popsicles frozen. This normally takes like about 20 to 25 minutes. That's it? done, yeah. Wow. So we take at least like 10,000 popsicles a week. 10,000 a week? Mm -hmm. Well, especially when it's hot outside, like oh, right yeah. now. Yeah. Look at that. Oh my goodness, those are gorgeous. So this is pineapple with chili? With yeah, chili. and this one's a strawberry cream. So what's the first treat you're going to show me? I want to show you the three Marys, the banana split, the sundae, and the mangoniada. You will see how we make it our own special tricks. And I get to eat every single bite of it. Absolutely. All right. <laughs> Let's go. What is the dish with the mango? We call mangoñada. It's basically it's mango sorbet with a splash of chamoy. Chamoy is basically a little uh, liquid, spicy flavor. do you have now? We have big locations uh, in Kansas and Missouri. Did you ever think the company no. was going to be this big? No, you know what, when we started, we, saw, we, we started in a small store um, and we never imagined that we were going to grow very fast. Going back to when you were a kid, what are your first memories of tasting like Mexican ice cream and yeah. paletas that you wanted to bring to your customers? That's funny because my first job, that was uh, a popsicle man. Really? With a little push car. When you were seven? Oh yes, I remember that day. That was amazing. You know, I was thinking like in my mind and say, you know, one day I can have my own business. Yeah. It's gonna be sell popsicles and ice cream. And you did that? And we did. Those popsicles are delicious, and the churros that they fry on site are incredibly, incredibly good. Fun stuff. Okay, so looking for a cup and a quarter, and that is about right. So I did smash up too many. I'm gonna save this because pretzel crust chicken is delicious. It's another way that you can um, use up kind of any leftover crumbs that don't make it into your tart. So I'm gonna set this aside. Now I'm going to stir into my pretzels. Quarter cup of brown sugar. You can use white sugar if you want, but I like the deeper flavor of the brown. Also going to add in a little bit of honey for some sweetness. 
and then six tablespoons of butter, all nice and melty. I'm just gonna stir this into my pretzel combination. It smells like heaven. I don't even know if we need to make the tart. Just eat this. Okay, I have my tart pan. It has a removable bottom. I'm just gonna pour my crust into here and then just press it along the sides. This is super easy. If you aren't comfortable baking and you wanna make a dessert that is something of a showstopper, this is the kind of thing that you will feel very comfortable doing because it is super easy. It doesn't require a lot of technical knowledge. You can see I'm just pressing this into the flutes of the pan. Do try to make it as even as possible. I'm just gonna blind bake this, and what that means is that the filling has not been put into the tart shell quite yet, and what that's going to do is allow it to crisp up before we add in our chocolate ganache mixture, which is going to be delicious. Speaking of chocolate, our next stop is at Askinosie in Springfield, Missouri. They are a true bean to bar chocolate maker. Let's go check them out now. I am here with Sean Askinosi in Springfield, Missouri, at the home of Askinosi Chocolate. When you walk into the factory, that rich aroma of roasting chocolate just hits you. Sean, your chocolates are known across the country, across the world. I mean, they really are some of the most highly regarded artisan chocolates made today. Tell me a little bit of your backstory, because you didn't start out in chocolate. No, I started out in criminal law, yeah. <laughs> which has no aroma to it whatsoever, except some jails do, maybe. I wanted to do something with my hands. I wanted to have a small company, not a big company, and I landed in chocolate, literally. And I'm so happy that I have, because one of the things that's really exciting to me about this, this chocolate world has no bottom to the pool. There's nowhere that we can rest our feet and say, we've learned the things we need to learn about chocolate because it's constantly changing. Even the masters would agree that there's always something more to learn and that's one of the exciting things to me about this. So what inspired you to do the single origin chocolates? I'm interested in single origin chocolate because I want to have a relationship with farmers and I want to highlight what the farmers have grown and the hard work that they've put in in achieving this flavor that you tasted. You're making a real impact on the lives of these people, like helping to support the school system in the towns that you're visiting. Our little factory of 17 people, we're feeding almost 2,000 kids a day now um, sustainably with no donations, and we have for several years. We're approaching a million meals that we provided and funded without any donations. That's not about chocolate, but it is about chocolate. It's about the chocolate. We hyper laser focus on the quality of our chocolate, like we're trying to do today at our tasting, and say to ourselves, what's wrong with this? What can we fix with this? How can we make this better? Okay, everyone ready? We'll taste the Del Tombo first. But then for as long as it sort of lingers, it kind of turns into that acidic sensation. Mm -hmm. But there was something right in the beginning that felt like it was out of order. Almost. It really is very, very, very traditional, what's called a Riba Nacional flavor, only grown in Ecuador. It's a completely different flavor than the first chocolate that we tasted. It's so much more mild, and it's not nearly as acidic as the other one. The other thing I'm noticing is the texture. Mm -hmm because like right now I still have a little bit of chocolate in my mouth. Can you see it? Oh, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so I have my hairnet on, my earplugs in, my apron on, and my beautiful purple gloves, and I'm about to learn how to mold these Askinosi chocolate bars by hand. Like this? Whoops. Anything else I have to put on? No, but I do have to make you change your gloves after the ear thing. Oh yeah, now that I've touched my ears, I can't do this. Okay. Basically, I'm going to fill these and then slide them to you. Sounds like an airplane. Awesome. Yeah. 
Yeah, that was really fun. Okay, I think you're ready to move on. If you're ready to move up. I'm ready. To the advanced mode. <laughs> Kinda hold it in place. There you go. Ooh, ah! Oh God. You got it, you got it. <laughs> oh, I messed it up. I don't know about that one. happened to come on a day when you were having one of your staff meetings and I noticed that you have each person kind of stand up and talk to their co-workers about the piece of the business that they kind of own. We want to make sure we're sharing everything and that people are sharing with each other so that sales people understand what production is doing and production understands sales and social media and marketing and chocolate and it's a very very important part of what we do. When people talk about artisan and say that it's a word that's thrown around and has no meaning now, that is true. But if you saw the way we roast, there's a lot of art to it that really is true. And we're always paying attention to time and temperature of the bean from crop to crop and origin to origin. The current roaster we have that we've had for almost 10 years has no thermostatic control. Oh. So it's like roasting on a campfire. You're the thermostatic basically. control. Yeah. When you get up and you come to work every day, what is it that you take away from that experience? This isn't about chocolate. It's about everything else. It's how can we improve the crop? How can we talk to the farmers about making the fermentation better? How do we make sure that they're using environmentally friendly practices and not clear-cutting um, rainforest? Those are things that have everything to do with the chocolate. And if this chocolate isn't perfect, if it isn't something that you want to spend $8, $10, $20 on a chocolate bar, then we are out of balance. Did I have all this planned out before? I had, no, no, I didn't. I didn't have any idea about that. And that's the part that I love about this job. I knew I wanted to be involved in people's lives, but I, I, I did not know how it would really change me. The chocolate that they make at Askinosi is delicious, but what is really striking about their story is the way that they source directly from their farmers. They're making a real impact on the lives of the folks who supply them with those unfermented beans. So we're going to get moving on the actual chocolate filling of our tart. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to finely chop 10 ounces of dark chocolate. You can do milk chocolate if you would like. It's entirely up to you. I like it really dark. This is 72%. And then I'm going to scald some milk on the stove. So I'm going to get started with the chocolate right now. My chocolate is chopped. And now this is heavy cream, and I want a cup and a quarter or so. I'm just going to take this over to the stove and get it up just barely to the boiling point. I'm going to come back and pour it on top of my chocolate. And what the cream is going to do is it's going to melt all of that chocolate. So I'm going to let it sit undisturbed for four or five minutes, and then I'm going to stir that in and finish up the rest of my ganache. So while I patiently wait, let's head to North City in St. Louis and meet the man behind the Crown Candy Kitchen. You know, we're a little family restaurant that's been uh, in North St. Louis City for 101 years now. We're third generation. You know, we're in the same location, doing the same thing we've been doing our entire uh, histories. Yeah, we make our own ice cream, make our own chocolates. We serve food all day. I said, so, um, you know, we're, we're nothing fancy, but, you know, we're kind of an institution in St. Louis. You know, my parents both said, go to college, get an education, you know, and after spending six months at Florida Valley eating cheese fries and drinking Dr. Pepper, I thought, nah, this isn't for me. I'm going to go to work down at Crowns, and, you know, I can work four or five days a week. It's easy money. You know, you know it's, it's a great life to lead. Well, that was, you know, 30 some odd years ago, and now I'm working, you know, 60, 70, 80 hours a week, depending on what season it is. But it, I love what I do. And, you know, there's a sense of responsibility that I have to this community and to my customers that I need to be here and doing what I'm doing because there's so much history and so many memories here. And, and so it's kind of on me to make sure that this is going the way it's supposed to. 
every once in a while I walk in here, it kind of you know blows my mind to think that we're this you know famous little iconic place in North St. Louis City. You know, I don't think my grandfather or even my father would have dreamt that we would be doing what we do today. We were never built to run hundreds of people through the store, you know, get them in, get them out, make all these malts. I mean, I made 523 malts on a Saturday. It was, you know, it's the record. And, you know, we sell 200 BLTs a day some days. So it's, like I said, it's just kind of sometimes makes me go, wow, this is pretty amazing what my family's accomplished on this corner. But it's, a lot of it has to do with the community, the customers. I mean, I'm not here if they're not here. So, you know, I owe most of it to them. So I, once again, I feel that obligation to be down here doing what I do. Anytime somebody will walk by and they will just, they'll stop and they'll thank me. They'll, they'll basically say, thank you for still being here. And, you know, like I said, I take it for granted, but I just come down here, open that door, I come to work and I do my thing. But, but when people really genuinely say, thank you for still doing this, thank you for still being on this car, I think any time that moment comes along, it really kind of makes everything I do worthwhile because to know that people on the other side of the counter really appreciate what we're doing, um, I think that's it. You know, that's just the little simple thank yous that people give me are probably the ones that I remember the most and are the most special to me. We're not a place trying to be old. We are old. I mean, I mean, you know, the candy cases are original. The soda fountain back bar is original. The booths are original. You know, the tin ceiling. So, so, I think that if people have a sense of just how many people and how many experiences and memories have been, you know, been made here, that's the thing. You know, the, the think like I said once again, we cram all that into this little bitty tiny space. You know, I. Yeah, it's, it, can be, it can be a little overwhelming to uh, think about the history, you know, of this corner. Personally, I love our Reuben. I think the Reuben's our best sandwich. But people have a love affair with bacon, so they get the BLT. And don't get me wrong, you can't go wrong with that. But, you know, for me, I'd say get a Reuben. Now, if you're with somebody else, you know, then get the Reuben and get the BLT. Share the sandwiches. Get one shake. Split that and then maybe get a little candy on the way out the door. My grandfather opened this business and he stuck with it. My father took it over and he stuck with it. And then my brothers and I took it over and now, you know, you know, it's it's on me to keep doing this and, and I'm I'm just lucky that I fell into this. So for those of you who do not live in St. Louis, Andy is very well known on Twitter. So you should follow him, he's hilarious. And he's a really great guy, really a fixture in the St. Louis food scene. Okay, my chocolate is just about melted. What I'm going to do now in this smaller bowl is mix together the other ingredients that I'm gonna be adding to my ganache. And that is two eggs, a couple of tablespoons of ginger liqueur, and then finely chopped candied ginger. Now you can play around with these flavors. You don't have to do ginger in this particular tart. You could add bourbon instead of ginger liqueur. You could add absolutely no alcohol at all. If that's what you'd like, you can add dried fruit. You could add nuts. Just kind of play around with it as a blank canvas. Okay. My eggs are thoroughly mixed. Here is that ginger liqueur. And then I'm going to finely chop some of this candied ginger. It's delicious. If you've never had candied ginger before, it takes the kind of bitter and very spicy aspect of ginger and kind of tones it down and balances it against this wonderful crunchy sugar. It's really, really tasty stuff. I'm gonna add most of this to my egg mixture. I want to make sure that I don't overwhelm the flavor of the chocolate because this is a very, very strong flavor. Now, get all of that chocolate and cream mixed together. If you've ever had a truffle, this is how you make truffles. You make ganache and then you just form it into balls. 
That's all you have to do. But you could use the same idea of flavoring truffles with things like bourbon or any kind of liqueur that strikes your fancy, dried fruits and nuts, all that yummy stuff. All right, so there we go. Smells amazing. Now I'm just gonna add in my eggs. I'm just gonna fold this in until we can't see any streaks of egg left. Time to pour this into our shell. I have my oven 350. I'm gonna pop this in for about 20 minutes, then we're gonna pull it out and let it cool. Heavy cream, because this recipe needs more cream. I'm just gonna whip this by hand. I'm not gonna add any sugar, because there is enough sweetness in this tart. You can see we're at nice stiff peaks with the cream now. Tart is nice and cool. And now is the fun part, get to enjoy. This is incredibly rich, so choose the size of your piece at your discretion. You can see just how dense this is. Gorgeous. I'm gonna dollop this with just a bit of whipped cream. And there you have it, dark chocolate ginger tort. A lot of flourless chocolate cakes get kind of dry or really dense. And this, because of the eggs, it has a lightness to it, but the flavor is really rich. And that ginger just comes right through. It's delicious. Thank you for joining me in our sweets episode in our best of season. I will see you next time.